if you're here today and, and uh, you're hearing a lot of stuff about following Jesus, confessing sins, different things along those lines, uh, one of the things I hope you'll figure out uh, about everyone that's here is that Jesus is pretty important. Uh, we talk a lot about him. Matter of fact, I'm going to argue that our life needs to be centered around him and an unquestioning obedience to follow him. And uh, I hope if you're here today and you, you hear about this, that, that if you're interested in what it means to be a follower of Jesus, that you'll learn a little bit more about that today. And uh, if you have questions about it, I would love to talk with you about what it means to follow Jesus as we gather here today. Now, as we've learned so far, and we're in a series in the Sermon on the Mount, so if you want to turn to Matthew chapter 5, your first book of the New Testament here, if you want to turn to Matthew chapter 5, that'd be a good place to go right now in preparation for us working through uh, some portions of this chapter here. But what we've learned so far is we've worked through this famous Sermon on the Mount. This is uh, probably the core of what Jesus taught. Uh, even though it's listed in its full, fullest form in Matthew, it comes up again in the book of Luke. But undoubtedly, it's something that Jesus taught and retaught repeatedly when he went into new areas. Because for Jesus, this is the kind of core teaching of what it means to be someone who has a right relationship with God. How you get that, what it looks like, is located right here. So it's something right at the center of what Jesus teaches. And what we learned from it so far is real life, and this is a, a startling statement, but real life, as Jesus teaches it, begins with getting him right. In other words, life begins when we put Jesus at the center of life as the lone, true deliverer, as the one that can truly save us or deliver us from the things that truly threaten us, and one of those right at the core of that, the only one who can deliver us from death. He's the only one that can help us understand the nature of life and is the unchallenged authority. And this doesn't mean that Jesus speaks on everything, but when Jesus speaks, his word is the final word. We submit to him and we live for him. Jesus alone can show us and take us to the life that God approves. This is why when Jesus starts the, the Sermon on the Mount, he begins with the famous Beatitudes, blessed are those who... Well, who's blessing them? Well, this is the person that God approves and therefore the one that knows God's blessing is the person who is poor in spirit. It's the person uh, who mourns over their sin. It's the person who's pure in heart. So Jesus alone can show us and take us there. He can not only teach us about it, but he can transform us to experience it. Now, as Jesus has made clear, putting him at the center of life as the one who addresses the core issues and allows us to develop real core strength, as we've been using that kind of word picture, is something that we need to do every day and, and day after day until he returns to complete us, complete what he's begun in us. Right? This is not something, there's no such thing as a follower of Jesus who makes some profession of faith or talks about how they're related to Jesus when they're five and then all of a sudden they take a vacation until they're facing their death. That's not the reality of a follower of Jesus. Once you come to understand who Jesus is and your need for him, once you recognize him and turn to him, you're going to hold on to him as best you can with all of your strength and lean in for him for help until you die. So being a trusting, obedient learner at the feet of Jesus and Jesus alone is the ongoing need of those who follow him. His teaching transforms and delivers us. Right? It, we, we, Jesus, when he teaches us, it's accompanied by his presence in the form of the Spirit. That's the empowering presence that changes us into the likeness of what he's teaching us about. So that we just don't learn that we should be people who mourn for our sin as he tr transforms us. You just do mourn for your sin. You're not, you don't have to be told Right? The Christian life isn't a bunch of people who have a set of lists and rules, and as things happen, they look over and say, oh, this happened. Okay, Jesus, what did you say? Mourn. Okay, I should mourn. Mm-hmm, and I mourn. Right? No, that's not about it. It's not a people who keep rules and know how to behave. Jesus changes you to the point that when it happens, you don't have to refer sideways. You've already been changed. You just mourn over it. Because that's inconsistent with who God has called you to be. That misrepresents him. That's made you into a person that's lost a little bit of your own humanity and disabled you from helping other people. You mourn over that. right? You just have, it's the same type of thing in, in Christian growth that you find if you have somebody who hates broccoli, 
right? You can, un, you can let them run freely through fields of broccoli and never have any worry about them eating it, right? You can prepare it all kinds of different ways and probably the only way they would ever eat it if they could eat it and not know that it was broccoli, okay? So Christians are people that get transformed from the inside out so that you just don't know, like as Steve was talking about last week, that it's wrong to look at a woman and conceive in your mind a sex act with her, that it's wrong you just look away. You don't have to consult it because you're changed. You don't look at her that way. You direct your eyes differently, right? You guard yourself. You set up scenarios in advance that you don't even get there. You don't go to those places. You don't go. So that's where God wants to take us to change us from the inside out. So it's, we, we had this here. Jesus alone teaches, does and teaches what God says is right, and only those who do and teach what he says will be right with God. Now, we know that that's an audacious statement, and the only reason that that statement could have any validity is if Jesus is a person who can back up our trust in him. Is he God? Is he the one that has all the credentials and the right to truly take the thing that really threatens you, your rebellion against God? Can he fix that? And has he done it in such a way that if you put your trust in him, you truly are free from the consequences of your sin and you've been truly made alive? Does he have the authority and right to do that? The whole book of Matthew, the gospels them saying is he has all the credentials so that you should trust his teaching and follow his way. Now, so I'd like you to stand with me. And this has been our kind of a key uh, thought that we've had here. And I want to read this together uh, here. You can see it up on the screen. This is Jesus' invitation in Matthew 11. I want to kind of set our own hearts and trajectory for what we're doing today. Uh, that we'll have Jesus, one of his famous sayings is, the audience, I'm looking for people who have ears to hear. All right? And Jesus wasn't talking about a class of people who didn't have any ears. He was talking about people whose hearts were set against his teaching. And so today, we're going to read Jesus' invitation and his intentions for his invitation Jesus is not inviting us to come to him to somehow just rule over our lives for our destruction. He's calling us to come to him so that we can find soul rest, right? So that we might be disposed. So read this with me, would you? Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Thank you. You may be seated. Now, I know I've challenged you to memorize this verse, and I want to encourage you to do that. And uh, I put it, if you go into my office at work, I have this big monitor that I use for the most of my computer work. And laying right there at the bottom of it is a little half sheet that Steve Ruffner printed out for me. And I got it right there at the bottom. And it's all marked up now. And then I'll look at it, and then I'll turn it over and I'll check myself on it and put it back. And here's what I would also encourage you. When you open your Bible, when you open your Bible, before you start reading it, it would be good to recite these verses. Come to me. Learn of me. Because when you're reading your Bible, you're not engaging some academic study. You're not engaging just some what ancient people said. It's the words of Jesus coming to you to give you rest. Okay, Do that. Now, oop, I put myself ahead and I'm not there yet. Uh, now, we are in a section of the sermon where Jesus is contrasting the righteousness he calls for and he alone makes possible with the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. Now, this is as my good friend Dr. Miller puts it, and he's writing an, an, a commentary on the book of Matthew, and he puts it this way, their approach to the law failed because it focused on the minimalistic and outward requirements the letter of the law, while Jesus went straight to the center and called for a transformed heart, the spirit of the law. And as we saw last week from Pastor Steve, Jesus makes it clear that it's not enough to avoid the act, outward act of murder. You've got to deal with an angry heart. And Jesus also made it clear it's not enough to avoid the outward act of adultery. You've got to go after a heart that's thinking wrongly about him or her. Now, in case you need a visual picture, I thought I'd help you today about the difference between the letter and the spirit of the law, okay? And I'm going to use my, uh, my daughter's dogs, Noli and Maverick, right? Maverick is up here on the, 
on the uh, cushion up here. And this is Noli, the younger one right here on the right. Okay? A maverick gives you a, a very good visual of what it means to the spirit of the law. What they're training them on is a command that's called place. And these are hunting dogs. And one of the things you want them to do is you want them to get set still until you tell them to get going. Well, that little cushion is supposed to be their place. Well, Noli is technically obeying the command, right? Technically obeying. She has like two feet up on the cushion, right? Now, in case you, you missed that one, here's another picture of Noli that's even better, right? And, and this one's even better because even though Noli has her back legs on that, you can tell that her heart wants to leave it. Right? So there's no, there's no spirit of the law that's going on here. She wants to be off that cushion. The only thing that she's there is that she's afraid of what might happen if she gets off the cushion. Okay? Now, in case you need another example, here's a couple of comics from good old Calvin and Hobbes, right? So here's Calvin. He's taking a text, a test here. Explain Newton's first law of motion in your own words. Oh, I got that. He gets an idea. Yaka fu mog, grug pub em up. Zinc, Watum, Gazork, uh, Chumble Spuzz. I love loopholes. Right? Well, those are his own words. There's no doubt about that. I mean, technically, it was the right answer. Right? Any of my students in here, do not ignore that. That will not work. Right? Or the bottom one here, right? His uh, moms, you can get this one. Right? Goodness, you're filthy. With the, well, uh, into the tub with you. I obey the letter of the law, if not the spirit. Let's hear some water running. Oh, nuts. Right? So the idea here is that you've got somebody that the spirit of the law is to go up, obviously, and take a bath. Well, not for Calvin. He's just complying with the letter of the law. So this week, we're going to look at two more illustrations from Jesus about what it means to be transformed from the inside out, to have the righteousness that he offers and that he calls for. He's going to illustrate it, and he's going to look at two things. He's going to look at contemporary attitudes to divorce. Remember, these are examples. There's all kinds of ways Jesus could do this, but he uses six different areas. This is two of them. He's going to use contemporary practices with regards to divorce, and he's going to look at contemporary practices with regards to oaths, and we're going to talk about what those are. And he's going to say this, and here's the two bottom-line things that he's going to say. In contrast to hard-hearted men and women who found legal loopholes to be unfaithful to their wives and husbands, Jesus is going to call them to faithful love. And in contrast to how people use wily words, right, religious-sounding words, to hide their lies, Jesus will call them to simple honesty. So we're going to talk about, he wants to emphasize that if you're a follower of Jesus, If you have been transformed, if you're following him, you will be marked by faithful love in your marriage, and you will be marked by simple honesty in your communication. Those are the two things he wants to go. All right, so let's talk about this first one here, divorce. So if you have your text, let's read it together. Uh, We're in uh, chapter 5, verse 31, and we want to read it here. Now it has been said, and again, this is a reference to the Old Testament law, quote, Whoever divorces his wife must give her a bill of divorce. But I say, and again in the text when Jesus says, I say, the emphasis is on the I. But I say that everyone who divorces his wife except on account of sexual immorality forces her to commit adultery, and whoever marries the divorced woman commits adultery. Now, The statement, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her, really, a bill or a certificate of divorce, this is really a part of much larger teaching on marriage that both Jesus and Moses give, right? So this is being plucked out. This is one of selective use of a verse that falls within a larger teaching about marriage. What Scripture teaches elsewhere is that marriage is intended to be a permanent and exclusive relationship. In Matthew 19, Jesus makes it clear that in marriage, God forges a real bond between the husband and the wife. And no one, those in the marriage or those outside the marriage, should seek to undermine it. So here, if you look in Matthew 19, this is what you would read in verses 4 through 6. And let me read it for you. Haven't you read, Jesus is speaking, that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female? And said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. 
So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Sometimes I, I do quite a few weddings. I've had the privilege of doing my daughter's weddings. And when I sit there and do that, I always tell the couples, I have a privilege, I've got Hannah Schick here today that was one of the students that Ron and I worked with uh, uh, when she came through in a program preparing for marriage. And uh, we always tell our couples, when we're marrying you, this is for life. And and if I meet you five years, ten years from now, I'm going to ask you questions. So Hannah walks in today, we hug each other, I'm so glad to see her, she'd text me, know we're coming. So immediately I just step in and say, Hannah, how are you guys doing? Right? And fine, they're doing well, we had a good conversation about it, but I want them to flourish for a lifetime because that's God's desire. And actually it's, it's always a little bracing for me to recognize that when that bond happens, that God has done something to unite these two people together that people shouldn't mess with. That's pretty weighty. Now, the importance of faithfully loving your spouse is negatively mentioned in Malachi 2, and some of you are familiar with this. Let me give you this passage. It's well worth our reading. Malachi 2, 13 to 16. Anything you do, another thing you do, he's speaking to the people of Israel. You flood the Lord's altar with tears. You weep and wail because he no longer looks with favor on your offerings or accepts them with pleasure from your hands. You ask, why? Why? It is because the Lord is the witness between you and the wife of your youth. You have been unfaithful to her, though she is your partner, the wife of your marriage covenant. Has not the one God made you? You belong to him in body and spirit, and what does the one God seek? Godly offspring. So be on your guard and do not be unfaithful to the wife of your youth. The man who hates and divorces his wife, says the Lord, the God of Israel, does violence to the one he should protect, says the Lord Almighty. So be on your guard and do not be unfaithful. So here God makes it clear that he hates divorce because it breaks the covenant the couple made, right? Underlying this is the command that that God gives, thou shalt not bear false witness. The command that they made uh, when they gave their marriage vows, and it does violence to the victim. It puts them in a situation of social and emotional harm. This is why a Christian wedding normally includes this statement, this statement in the vows, and I use it in all of them. I will keep myself to you and you only as long as we both shall live. God intends marriage to be permanent arrangement. Faithfully loving your spouse over life should be the believer's main concern. However, when this statement's taken out of its context, which is what's happening here, right? Uh, I told you we're in the political season now. You're going to see all kinds of scripture abused and used inappropriately because people want to grab a little bit of the cachet of the Bible or things that religious people might think are important, and they're going to sprinkle it over things that sometimes are completely opposite of what God would teach and try to convince religious people that this has got God's approval, like killing babies right up until the time that they're born. Okay? That's one of them that Scripture is being used to endorse. So they were plucking that little statement about divorce, they were plucking it right out of the larger block of Jesus' teaching, and some of the Pharisees of Jesus' day argued that a man could divorce his wife for nearly any reason. They only focused on the second half, and they said, well, as long as you give somebody a certificate of divorce, you're going to be okay with God. So technically, as long as you give a certificate of divorce, it doesn't make any difference why you divorce the person. Just make sure that you give a certificate and everything is great. Now what was happening then is that this list for things you could divorce your spouse over, it started to look more and more contemporary like modern day America, right, in terms of that. All kinds of different things like we've grown apart, right, Uh, you know, it's a bad time of the year, right, the guy doesn't brush his teeth, right, whatever, okay? So when you come to these, this is the kind of things that you have. And I just want to li- read you a little short list, and it's a long list, but I'll read you a little bit of a, a short list of things you could divorce your wife for, okay, by God's permission. A man could divorce his wife if she had a head that was wedge-shaped, turnip-shaped, or hammer-shaped, or if her head was otherwise malformed, such as sunk in or flat at the back. He could divorce his wife if she had poor posture or if she had thinning hair. He could divorce her if she had no eyebrows or only one eyebrow or bushy eyebrows, right? We're we're into the eyebrows. He could divorce her if she had a pug nose. 
the condition of her eyes was particularly important. If she, if, her, if she had eyes too high or too low, if she were cross-eyed or had no eyelashes, had eyes of two different colors, she had watery eyes or eyes big as a calf or small as a goose. Any of these were justified divorce. The man could divorce his wife if her nose were too big or too little, her ears too little or too floppy. If she had an overbite or an underbite, missing teeth, a poor figure, right? On and on and on. Suffered uh, from swelling of the big toe. That must have been terribly important, right? If the sole of her foot was as wide as that of a goose. Or if she was ambidextrous. Daggone it, you don't want that in your wife, right? Now, I'm telling you about those things because now it sounds... Oh, that's ugly. That sounds so self-centered and selfish, and every woman in here ought to just be almost angry, right? And think of, I got my own list about men I'd like to put out there, right? So the issue is, is that nobody, the letter of the law was being observed, but the spirit of the law was completely lost. Nobody was concerned about loving their spouse generously. They were just concerned about getting what they want. So Jesus, as Moses, permits divorce as something that may be necessary in some cases. And as, again, as pastors, as people who love you and, and counsel people, there are times when a divorce needs to happen. And it's the wise course. It needs to happen. But it's the exception rather than the norm. However, what he wants to say is that the, the, the grounds he gives for divorce, sexual immorality, are much more limited than these current practices that you find. This means that most of the divorces taking place were illegitimate, since the grounds were illegitimate. Who cares what kind of legal document you have? That doesn't make it good in the eyes of God. So here, one commentator puts it this way. According to Jesus, a man who divorces his wife, or if we read Jesus' comments in Mark, a wife divorcing her husband, A man who divorces his wife for any reason other than sexual infidelity causes her and her potential future spouse to commit adultery. If there has been no sexual infidelity, meaning no biblical grounds or no godly grounds that need to uh, to cause a divorce, there can be no real divorce. If there has been no real divorce, there can be no real remarriage, and additional sexual unions are adulterous ones. That's pretty hard work. So although the husband considers himself technically righteous and wants others to think the same, right? These are Pharisees and scribes. These are the the leaders of the Jewish people. They're supposed to embody God's will and God's heart, right? So everything that they do is supposed to be exemplary of what's going on. They want other people to think this is the model you should follow. All this person really has done is use the law against its intent so that he can put a religious cover over his sin. Yet his unfaithfulness in his marriage vows and the disrespectful, degrading, and unloving treatment of his wife exposes the fact that his heart is devoid of any real righteousness at all. So what do we learn? Let's just draw some lessons here about what we learn about Jesus' teaching on marriage. And if you have something you want to write down, this may be one of them here today, uh, if you're doing that. But I just want to give you four things uh, uh, that come out of this. And again, there's much more to say because this isn't a sermon on divorce and remarriage. It's just trying to talk about what Jesus used as an example. But it's very clear that God intends marriage to be permanent. So we're going to come back to this. And this means that if you're a person who believes that marriage is permanent, then you should be looking for, if you're trying to get married, if you're anticipating marriage, you should be looking for somebody else with that same vision of marriage. It's supposed to be a one man, one woman for a lifetime, and it's supposed to be marked by faithful love, a permanent bond of faithful love. The second thing here is the marriage bond can be broken by sex with someone other than your spouse and makes divorce in this case permissible, though what Jesus wants to say is it's not demanded. It's not demanded. doesn't mean it has to happen. Matter of fact, as we, if we were going to go through the book of Matthew, One of the most difficult teachings of Jesus in Matthew 18 is his teaching about forgiveness. His teaching about forgiveness, which just precedes his teaching about marriage and divorce in chapter 19. And his marriage about his teaching about forgiveness is that famous parable that you know where the guy uh, goes to his uh, uh, the person that he works for and he owns him. He owes to him a bajillion dollars. Right. And the guy that he, owe, he owes the money to is, is broken over him and the cost of it, doesn't want to throw him into prison. 
And so he forgives them this horrible debt that he could never repay. And then that guy walks out and he meets his buddy down the street and his buddy owns, owes him, you know, two bucks because he bought him coffee last time when he was out there. The guy owes him two bucks and he says, I want my two dollars. And the guy says, well, I can't pay you. And the guy says, well, okay, I'm going to call the warden, the police, I'm going to throw you into prison until I get every last cent out of you. And Jesus comes back and saying, we as the people of God who have been forgiven everything, a debt that we could not repay, how can we not forgive each other when we sin against each other? So here, uh, the idea here is that the marriage bond can be broken, but it's not something that must happen. It's something that may need to happen, but it's the exception rather than the norm. And then thirdly, to divorce your spouse for a reason not permissible by God is a sin for the one who divorces. It forces their spouse into adultery as well as anyone who marries them. In God's eyes, when a person kicks somebody to the curb and wants to walk away from them, uh, that person in God's eyes is still married and they still have the obligations and they're held accountable before God for that. And then fourthly, to sum it up, Jesus' righteousness creates people who want to be and calls for people to be faithful in their marriage covenant. This applies, right? Barry and Sally came in to our church today. One of our obligations to Barry and Sally as man and wife is to be people who encourage the, the health and growth of their marriage. Because not only are Barry and Sally responsible for loving each other, as God has called them to, but every man and woman around them is to pray for them and encourage them and live before them to help them do that. And as they grow and change and as they get older and as things happen with their kids, our job is to love them toward Jesus and love them toward each other. I've, t I've come to take that more seriously when I do a wedding now. I often have a charge to the congregation who's there, right? The ideal wedding is you got this couple. They start off way down here, and uh, they, get, they start to get to know each other. And very soon, if they figure out that this guy or this girl is a keeper, right, something that may go long term, they start inviting people into that relationship to put their eyes on it. People that they know uh, uh, follow Jesus and love Jesus so that they can give some wisdom in case they've got a blind spot to what's going on. So they invite him in and say, Dad, what do you think about this guy? With Evan, I said, he's a keeper, right? Same thing here. Evan's sitting here, right? Evan's got his family looking over at Dominique, and they're looking at each other. And hopefully you're moving down this path. And when you get at the altar, what is there is you've got this whole group of people sitting out there, and they're gone. He makes sense for her. She makes sense for him. They make sense for the kingdom. Let's do it, Right? And then everybody out there is saying, and I'm going to commit my life to help them walk together through the rest of their life. And I'm, my marriage needs to be an example to them. My life needs... So a part of me loving Ronna well is about loving my own kids well. Okay? And so this is the idea that Jesus says here. Those who know God's approval, who manifest the righteousness of the kingdom that comes through coming under the rule of King Jesus, they believe marriage is to be marked by faithful love. Consequently, they enter into it with the intention to be faithful to God's intentions for their union. You know, I, start, I was going to read you some prenuptial agreements here today, and it was just too depressing. I, I didn't want to read those to you. Uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the prenuptial agreements are basically, you know, okay, I'm going to make my marriage vows. See my fingers? They're right here. I'm going to make my marriage vows, but in case you don't meet these conditions, let's just spell them out up front, right? Then you, you're out. So both partners are to enjoy the security that comes from a lifelong commitment where each serves the other. Think about this. Each forgives the other. Each complements the other, not competes with each other. And both build something together empowered by and directed by Christ. In Jesus' teaching, divorce is a sad exception tied to a terrible break in the marriage covenant by breaking the one flesh union. It's not an easy way out of marriage challenges. Right? Anybody who's married in here, if they're honest, there's challenges. Right? Ron is perfect, it's hard to live with that. Right? She's perfect, she has good days all the time. It's really hard to live with that. Right? So marriage has challenges. Right? And it's not something, divorce is not something you keep in your pocket in case you see a better offer somewhere or somebody can offer you more money or you can have more status by attaching yourself to somebody else. 
And it's not something that you use to manipulate someone by keep threatening them that, you know, hey, if you don't measure up, I'm out of here. Okay. My wife and I said to each other as we struggled with that at the beginning, divorce is off the table. It's off the table. We just don't bring it up because we're going to struggle with each other over life. I'm trusting God that me and this woman here, we need to work well and hard with each other over life. And in that, Jesus is going to grow me up and change me. So according to Jesus, any approach to marriage that rejects faithful love is a virtue, right? Where you put God at the center and you love another consistently and despite their difficulties, right? Here's the one thing that always gets me. Parents will do this generously with their kids, but they won't do it with their spouses. They have more long-suffering patience for their children than they do for their husband or their wife. And I just want to emphasize here that God says that when he put you as husband and wife together, he made a bond between you. Right? And so he's after that. So this is something he wants to get. We need to exemplify as God's people the same sort of love that Jesus exemplifies for us. When we get to Matthew 28, you know what? Jesus is going to send us out on the commission. He's going to say, all right, everybody, now I've taught you. Now you need to go and teach everybody right? And you need to make disciples. You need to tell them about who I am and invite them to come underneath my benevolent rule so that they can come to life because I'm going to return. And all authority is given to me so you don't have to worry about it. You have all the authority that you need, right, in heaven and earth. Okay? But then you know what he says at the last? And just be, just be reminded, I am with you always. That's a good one to put in your marriage vows. I am with you always, right? That's the love of Jesus. Okay, now, so the first thing is followers of Jesus believe God's, God's way is best, the spirit of the law, and they are not looking for loopholes that will allow them to appear faithful to their vows, to put a good face to seem reasonable or respectable. What they're really trying to do is just break their commitments for selfish reasons. Followers of Jesus will lean on Jesus to love their spouse through life. And I might say friends, family members, relatives, followers of Christ, church members. It's faithful love, right? Number two, okay? Oaths, right? From wily words to simple honesty. The next example Jesus uses to get the righteousness of the kingdom is the practice of oath-taking. Right? What is this? So let's read this passage. Again, you had heard that it said to the people long ago, do not break your oath. And here it's really, don't commit perjury to lie under oath, but fulfill to the Lord the vows you have made. But I tell you, do not swear an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by the earth, for it's his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it's the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot even make one hair white or black, or in my, my thing, I can't even retain one hair, right, uh, in terms of that. All you need to say is simply yes or no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. Now, the statement that Jesus presents here when he says, do not break your oath, but fulfill to the Lord the vows you have made, he's combining two Old Testament texts, and we're not going to read those, one from Leviticus and one from Numbers. And they describe a legitimate practice things that we find. Jesus responded under oath. We're going to find that in Matthew 26. And Paul, the Apostle Paul, occasionally took oaths himself. But what Jesus is prohibiting here in these next three verses are human practices that go far beyond what's found in the Bible. And again, just like the person in the marriage covenant, they're going to take a loophole approach instead of a spirit of the letter approach. So, the practice of oath-taking is not, not very common, so let me define these two terms for you. What is an oath? What is a vow? Okay? Uh, we're often not in the practice of doing those. In general, this comes from uh, Charles, Charles Quarles here in his book on the Sermon on the Mount, vows are promises made to God. Right? So I make a promise to God, I vow I'm going to do something. Oaths, on the other hand, are promises or assertions made to another human being which invite a divine curse if the promise is broken or the truth is not told. So you can say an oath to say, I'm telling you the truth right now and I swear by such and such. Okay? 
or you're looking at something you're going to do in the future and you're saying, I will do this in the future and I call God to hold me accountable. And if I don't do it, may he bring judgment on me. Okay? That's what an oath is. Now, both words here, vows and oaths, they appear in our passage because an oath is an appeal to God to guarantee the truth of something, right? You're saying, or the genuineness of your commitment to something that you're going to do in the future. But the appeal to God to hold you accountable for that then makes it a vow that you're making to God because he's the one that's going to assure that you complete it. So you must speak the truth or you must truly intend to do and must follow through on what you say you will do or you will invite divine punishment on you okay? for using God to cover your lies. Now, if you remember when, Samuel, when uh, David and Jonathan... We're getting ready to part under the threat of Saul killing David. They made an oath to each other. And it gives us a picture of what an oath is. And if you wanted to read this later on or write this down, you can see this oath, and it's in 1 Samuel 20. I just wanted to read to you so you get a sense of what an oath is. Then Jonathan said to David, this is verse 12, I swear by the Lord, the God of Israel, that I will surely sound out my father by this time, this, this time tomorrow. Day after tomorrow. So he's making a vow to him, an oath, saying that I, I'll call God in to punish me if I don't do it, that I will do what you ask, which is I'm going to try to find out from my father whether he's going to kill you or invite you back. And if he is favorably disposed toward you, will I not send you a word and let you know? And he says, I will. But if my father intends to harm you, may the Lord deal with Jonathan, be it ever so severely, if I do not let you know and send you away in peace. So Jonathan says, I will do this, and I'm calling God to a witness, and if I don't go and ask my dad about this, and I don't return and report to you, may God strike me down. So now I've got a commitment to God that I've made to you. Okay. So in Jesus' time, though, instead of swearing by the Lord, and this is where I want you to get this here, instead of swearing by the Lord and actually making yourself accountable before God, people were getting into the habit of substituting heaven, or the throne of God, or Jerusalem, or even their own head. Okay? Now get to what was happening here. This would add an air of truth to their speech because they were all things associated with God. They sound, you know, weighty. Or in the case of their head, when you think about what's somebody doing when they're, they're taking an oath by their head, right? It made it sound as like they were putting their own life on the line. Like I'm putting my own life on the line here when they were cleverly putting themselves in the role of God in that oath. Right? They can't guarantee the truthfulness of their own oath. Right? God can do that from the outside, but they're cleverly putting God in the place and they're making it sound like it's something really serious, like, you know, may, I mean, cross my heart and hope to die. Cross my heart and hope to die. Right? On my own head. Kind of idea. But because it was not technically, now get it, when you say heaven, you're not technically saying God. When you say the throne of God, you're not technically saying God. And when you say Jerusalem, you're not technically saying God. So because it was not technically calling on God himself, they were not really obligating themselves to follow through under threat of divine punishment. This is a pretty clever way to get out from under it. So these clever word plays amounted to nothing more than a smokescreen for their real intent to allow loopholes for them to lie. Technically, they could not be accused of lying or breaking their word, and they didn't have to worry about God's punishment for doing so. This is like the child, as he talked about, right? Cross my fingers, right? Behind your back, I'm telling you this. Or here's, here's maybe even a better one if you think about it. The guy who swears to the truth uh, to something on the grave of my dead mother. I mean, I swear on the, on the grave of my dead mother. After all, who would lie if that would mean God might strike his mother dead? I mean, my goodness, I mean, the guy obviously loves his mom, and nobody wants their beloved mother to die. He must be telling the truth. I swear to you, on the grave of my dead mother, right? And all that, you go, mm, okay, am I supposed to believe that, right? That's the kind of thing. So Jesus, he sees right through this, okay? He sees right through these wily words to people who are wholly corrupt, right? They're looking for a loophole. A heart submitted to God's kingdom will produce a pattern of truthful statements, a simple yes or no. Now, I'm going to prepare you here just as I get there. This one hurt me a lot this week. This hurt me a lot. I think, I'm not, I'm not perfect by any means, but, but 
my wife and I, by God's grace, and I say that deeply, truly, by God's grace, that's not a, that's not a throwaway line, by God's grace, we've been married for 36 years. By God's grace. Not because there's anything about Greg and Rana that's made that happen, but because God has been gracious to us with all kinds of failures and stupidity. By God's grace, that's where we are. But this one, this one about being truthful, man, it stung me this week. Jesus wants it to be the idea that if Greg says yes, that's yes. If he says no, that's no. And he said what he meant, and he meant what he said. The old thing is, you know, his word as good as his bond. That's what Jesus calls for. Now, here's one I want you to think about. The ways we use wily words to deceive other people. And I want to suggest to you, we use deceptive speech to deceive others. That includes, those others include our spouses. They include our bosses. They include our parents. There's not a person in here, because I one thing I know that every person in here has had is a parent, okay? That's just biology, right? So everybody had a parent. There isn't a person in here that if you would spend a little bit of time, that you can't think back to the time that you led your parents to believe something that was not true. Right? And sometimes it was just through selective silence. Well, nobody really asked me, so I'm not going to tell anybody. And so I left the impression that when I was out with that girl on a date, that we behaved responsibly, when in reality, I know we didn't. And since nobody asked me, I'm not going to own it. Okay. I know that I wasn't supposed to be on that, uh, that, that, that phone, and I wasn't supposed to be in that direction, but nobody asked me, so I'm not going to say it. And then if somebody tells me, I'm going to tell them the good place I went, and I'm not going to be full about where I was altogether. I mean, all of us know that, right, in terms of that. And now, as big people, we do it with bosses. Right? We do it with all those kinds of things. We do it with our spouses. Now, here's one. Let me just sting me. Uh, Rana will give me a call. Right? This is nothing to do bad about Rana. She'll give me a call, and I am late at work. It's something that only happened to me like a million times. Right? So I'm late. I should have been home. We've got commitments there. And, and I see right, the phone call comes, and I do have Rana in my contact so that when it comes up, I recognize her. I even have a picture that comes up right there. Right? So she calls me, and, I, and I, I, immediately I've got this ethical dilemma because I'm sitting in my office, and she knows I should be on the road by now, right? Even more so, I should be at home right now. The reason why she's calling me is like it's 15 or 20 minutes past the time I should be home, and I haven't even left the office, so there's going to be another 15, 20 minutes before I even get home. And so what I found myself doing, right, like a little kid who got caught, she'll call me, and so to try to avoid an ugly, awkward moment on the phone, right? Ron and I have had a few of those over time, right? To have this awkward, ugly moment on the phone. I will try to present my location as, as advantageous as possible for my trip home, right? And it's all selectively like, Greg, where are you? Honey, I'm on my way home right now, which means I'm standing up from my desk and packing my briefcase, that's exactly what I'm doing. Okay, I'm standing up right now. I got my briefcase back. And my wife, being a little bit more savvy about this over time, like, Greg, have you even left the office yet? <laughs> now, now, what do I do with that? Well, honey, I'm on my way, right? I'm trying to put the best face on it right out. And she goes, Greg, what is going on? You should have been home here. We, we got commitments. We got things to do. And all the way, I'm just lying. I don't like to talk about it that way. But instead of me just owning it, right? And of course, it would have been better if I'd been responsible to leave earlier, Right? In terms of that, instead of me just owning it, my, instead of wanting to be a person of integrity, I find ways to lie my way out of it. Right? I, and I know that's never happened to any husbands in here. That's unique to me. Right? But, but those kind of things. Um, how many times have you said to somebody, I pray for you, and you didn't intend to, and you didn't? But that's what a Christian should do, Right? So you came up to me, and I said, I'll pray for you, but I don't intend to do that. That's just a nice statement to say, oh, I'm sorry. I'm glad that went that way. But I didn't actually talk to God about you at all. Right? I'm pray for you. Or we've been in, this is Christian things, right? I'm, I'm skewering us, because here we are, right? Where we come to a prayer meeting, and we should pray for, and really all that is is a pretense to gossip about something. Let, oh, so-and-so is having such a difficult time. Well, let, let's, talk, let's pray for that. 
In reality, it makes you the person in the know, and everybody, oh, that's a, and then everybody's fighting for the best prayer request for that prayer meeting. Oh, man, that was a class 10 prayer request there. Oh, I don't really have one, right? And then you see people trying to one-up each other. Well, I, I got so-and-so, and they got a bad diagnosis. Great. No, I was driving in, and a plane crashed on Route 35. Oh, my goodness. You got the prayer request of the night right there, right? Now, I'm telling you the kind of things that happen to us all the time. Pa- spouses lying to each other. Uh, get, give you another ugly thing. Ron and I, we have different financial views of things, right? Now, on the big things, we're, we're united, but on other things, don't. So I'm just being transparent with you about my own immaturity and, and lack of, uh, of honesty early on in my marriage, okay? I like to drink coffee. Rana doesn't like to. She needs to come to Christ eventually, but one of these days will happen. Right? I love to drink coffee. She has no space in her budget or time for drinking coffee, right? A lot of times when I meet with students, I meet over coffee, right? I, it's, a, it's a twofer. I get to drink coffee, and I get a love on them, right? So it's just both of those, right? So Rana, every so often, when things go, she would look down, and she keeps the books on her house. She'd look down and say, Greg, you just spent like $10 this week at Beans and Cream, right? Which with her is just like, you just went and you lit it on fire and threw it in a trash can. <laughs> like, what are you doing with that 10 bucks, right? And so you know what I started to do to avoid that instead of confronting that, which we eventually had to do and say, hey, Rana, we've got different values. We got to talk about what I'm doing with this $10, and it's not about that. And we got to go after it. We had to have a robust conversation of honesty. You know what I started doing is I started drawing money out of the checking, at the savings account, which you wouldn't see for over a long period of time, so I could have my coffee and not have a discussion with her every day. Come on. You guys never done any stuff like that? Right? I mean, I'm, I'm telling you, wives, you know how, and I don't want to go through that with him. I'm not going to do it. And so we lie and we lie and we lie. And so your yes is not a yes and your no is not a no. Right? So all those types of things that we do is this is what Jesus is after. He wants people who faithfully love. And I was thinking about, I'll skip here to the end, is this example. I like this example. Uh, Faithful love and simple honesty. That's the righteousness that Jesus calls for. Faithful love and simple honesty. Uh, I've told you about this uh, with my wife before. Uh, the, one of the ways you can get Rhonda to cry, really easy, it's really easy to get her to cry, certain ways, is if we're walking out in public and she sees an old couple who are tender and they love each other. She's already crying up here, right? And she'll just see them, she'll just see them, and, and she'll go there, and she'll turn to me every time. She will point them out to me and say, Greg, that is so sweet, that is so good. I, I don't know if she's trying to encourage me, Greg, you should be more like that, or I hope we get there, right? Wh- whatever it is, but she points it out, right, to me, because there's a sweetness about it. It's sweet. To me, when, when, my, when my dad died and my mom and dad had been married for 59 years, the, the weeping of my mom, the deep sense of absence and brokenness testified to the depth of something that I hope Ron and I know. Right? So, the issue here, Jesus says, come to me and I'll give you rest. Come to me. Trust me that to love faithfully over life, trust me that to be simply honest is the way to find rest for your souls. Man, it takes a lot of energy to live a life of lies. If you're in here and you're hiding from people the fact that you don't know Jesus, but you know you should behave in a certain way, man, it takes a lot of energy to keep covered up. All right? So James, will you come? He's going to lead us in a song here, and I want to pray with us as we, as we finish up here. I'm going to sing together. Dear Jesus, we love you today. God, we're so grateful, (laughs) Lord, that you love us all the way deep down inside. Lord, you don't want to create people who are just got paint on the outside and all we are is just dead tombstones with all kinds of darkness and ugliness inside of our soul so that we just become uh, things that have just been kind of gussied up on the outside. Lord, you want to go all the way in and change us from the inside out. Lord, do a work in us today. Help us to be responsive to what you want to do. So Lord, help us, Lord, as we sing, Lord, teach us, convict us, Lord, help us to establish new patterns. Oh, Lord, we need you in Christ's name. Amen.